Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, where, uh, wherever you're joining from around the world. Uh, we are delighted to have you join us at Solutions House 2024. So thank you everyone for taking the time to be part of our third annual New York Climate Week event. I want to give a warm thank you to all our partners who've made this possible. So this is an, an initiative of Futera and Google, an exponential roadmap, and for the first time, the Sustainable Entertainment Alliance has joined us as a partner as, as well. So woo, to the partners. Um, now, the Solutions House Hub has a motto, and it is answers only. Now, the problems are huge and vast in tackling climate change in just an equitable way, but they are widely identified and discussed elsewhere. So while you're in here, it's answers only. We've got three days of incredible programming. We've got film screenings, comedy nights, parties. We've got how you can create change uh, within and outside of organizations. We've got non-boring approaches to carbon accountancy. We've got the whole lot. Um, now, this is the first year that we've graduated from the Futera offices, so it's bigger and fancier and very exciting, but also the same deal applies. If you, if you need any help, Futerans are around who can help you. And also our uh, office dog, Tagada, who belongs to Alice, will be making an appearance. Hopefully. She is very, um, she likes the fame, so if you <laughs> applaud, she will be appearing up on the stage to take her bow. <laughs> She's also French. So, you know, if you need to say taga de non, that is, that is the way to communicate. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, so housekeeping. We've got no fire alarm scheduled. Um, if anything goes off, please follow the exit signs out of the building. Uh, and this session is live streamed and recorded. So we really want to get some questions from the floor and online. But if you do ask a question, you'll be included as part of the um, live stream and the readout afterwards. Uh, we've got a couple of hashtags uh, if you want to post. Solutions House NYC, Climate Week NYC, and all these sessions being uploaded onto YouTube to post afterwards. Um, so, I'm Lucy Shea. I'm the CEO of Futera and a trustee of Futera Solutions Union. And that's, uh, I'm really absolutely delighted to start actually to have our second panel on day two with this session on how you can make change as an insider working in advertising and consultancy. Um, many, many, many people work in those industries. Uh, we've got folks working around the world in professional services from advertising, but also wider, um, legal, consultancy, uh, all sorts. Uh, and. You know, 10 years ago or so, that profession was really widely neglected in terms of an understanding and a commitment to how it can serve climate solutions, not climate disaster. No longer. We've got lots in play nowadays. And if you're here for a few days in Climate Week, you will have attended other events where there's been various launches of professional services frameworks, and there's more of those here at Solutions House as well. But for today, what we're really going to focus on is starting from the advertising industry and going out to wider professional services with this fantastic panel, what you can do working in this industry to create change. So I'm going to take a seat and I'll introduce our panelists one by one. Um, we'll talk for about 30 minutes or so, 35, and then we'll have a good session on um, uh, questions from the floor. Now, towards the end of the panel, we've got an uh, exciting launch, uh, and I'll cue Alice in to talk about that. But for the moment, I'm gonna take a seat and say welcome, everyone. Um, so, Rob, uh, I'm gonna pass to you first. Uh, Rob McFall is the co-founder of Purpose Disruptors, um, absolute uh, leaders in this field of working within the advertising community to create change. Um, Rob, talk to us a little bit about uh, what the role of advertising in the transition, as, as, 
as we require a whole of economy and whole of society approach to moving towards climate solutions, just and equitable climate solutions, tell us a little bit about the role of advertising and then what you can do, uh, what individuals working in those industries can do. Thank you, Lucy. Yeah, delighted to be here. I think to answer that question, perhaps, yeah, I'd like to answer that question by just sharing the origin story of Purpose Disruptors and why we came to be and what we're doing in response to that question about what is the role of advertising. So at Purpose Disruptors, we exist to change the story of advertising, to change its story from one of extraction to one of regeneration to one where advertising uses its skills and its creativity to be in service of life. And for us, like all good things, it started in a pub maybe five years ago, where myself <laughs> and my fellow co-founders uh, who across, work across the ecosystem, across media, creative and client side, we, the thing that united us, apart from working in advertising, was that we were, had a deep understanding of the scale and urgency of climate change, but also had made a connection with our day jobs, in that the better we were in our day jobs, in driving growth, we were driving consumption, we were driving emissions. And we just asked us, well, what do you do with that tension? Because you really like, you, you feel like you've been doing a good job and you are driving the economy, but you're also now part of the problem. And from what started as a, a pub night of a dozen of us asking that question and saying, is anyone else thinking the same as us? Or is it just us? And no, it grew and grew to the point where we are now an organization who work with all of the big six ad networks and advertisers. Um, across um, education, um, inspiring them to uh, use their skills to, um, to understand that they are architects of desire. That yes, it's important to look at your operational footprint, but actually the biggest influence you have are on the values and the levels of consumption that you drive, and also the types of clients that you're promoting and what you're promoting with those clients uh, around creativity. So how do you def redefine what a good life looks like? What is our, what is our skills in in creativity, again, to imagine what is a good life in a, in a thriving, sustainable world. And then lastly, we sort of look at also our impact. So how can we encourage the advertising industry to, to look beyond its operational emissions to its wider impact and make a holistic approach to its, um, to its climate transition plan? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's something, um, yeah, one of the reasons why I'm here in New York, actually. Uh, thank you. Um, and uh, spoiler alert, um, there might be a few pub origin stories <laughs> coming up. There is a common theme we have identified in our pre-starter chat. Uh, Rob, uh, you, what's... Uh, here's Tagada. I told you she would be here. Um, well, I'm cute. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, tell us a bit about... You mentioned some of the frameworks you've been putting together. So you mentioned the kind of what is a good life and the, the role of status and desire. But... Give us a little bit about the kind of logic underpinning that you've created for that, if you could summarise for that for us, because if you were outside of the industry, there are a gazillion, there are lots of frameworks for managing scope one, scope two, scope three, but actually not everyone knows there's been a lot developed for advertising as well, or those um, brain print impacts, if you like, uh, and advertiser missions is one of the amazing one of them. So tell us, summarise that for us, would you? Sure. Perhaps, yeah, to explain what advertised emissions is. So advertised emissions are the emissions that come from the sales uplift directly due to, due to advertising. So it's this simple principle that if an agency champions and takes responsibility for the growth it drives that client, then as a consequence it must take responsibility for some for the emissions that come from that growth. And for us it's a way uh, for the industry to understand and accept its sort of full responsibility it has for the influence it has on the world. And from that point go, well, how then do we transition uh, the, the, the kind of work we do with clients, the kind of work that we're promoting, and perhaps and also transition our, our client portfolio as well. And it's something that's actually inspired uh, the wider concept of service divisions. And I was at Race to Zero yesterday talking about the consultation that we were doing with them around how the bigger opportunity for professional service providers, for those in the room who perhaps work in um, management consultants or lawyers or accountancy and indeed advertising to understand that that is where the opportunity lies is understanding what is the influence we have how do we measure that influence how do we transition uh, to a, a line of work a portfolio of work which is in line with 1.5 degrees um, and have developed an action a set of actions 
to enable um, organizations to apply that uh, framework to, to their organization. And it's not just a theory. Uh, part of the work that we're doing is, um, is working with agencies to uh, apply this, uh, this framework. Uh, and it's something that we've been working on, which we will publish tomorrow, a case study where Emily Sachi and Oliver have actually adopted advertised emissions as part of their climate transition plan. So it's not just a, yeah, an idea, it's something that's actually been practically used, it's decision useful, it involves, it involves yeah, uh, influencing strategy and, 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 and the, the client work as well. I put my glass down there without drinking, because I think that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> Woo! Got... <laughs> I, I know it's been an enormous amount of work putting together that framework, and to have it adopted by two leading agencies is awesome. Now, um, uh, tech team, we would love to talk for another 50 minutes, but I think the clock might need to start, otherwise we, we will just keep going. Um, so, Duncan, let's move to you. Um, uh, Duncan Meisel is the founder of Clean Creatives, uh, another star in this movement to kind of um, uh, 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 bring solutions to the advertising industry. And um, uh, now I know you've had a very exciting launch recently, so you'll tell us a bit about that. But first, if I may, can you pick up from what Rob was saying and say, as an individual working inside advertising or inside the advertising ecosystem, what can you do to create change? So at Clean Creatives, um, we have a saying which is more is more. Um, anytime you have an opportunity to bring up the relationship between advertising PR, fossil fuels, and climate change, you have an opportunity to make progress on this issue. Um, we also have the saying which is no is normal, um, that when you're bringing up these challenging ideas, when you're trying to make change, you're gonna hear the word no, and that's fine. That just means that you have learned something about the people around you and it's gonna help inform your next round of engagement. So the core of what we think you know, our theory of change should be is speaking out, speaking honestly, being polite but persistent, and connecting with your colleagues because you know, Clean Creatives, we've been working with people in 63 countries now in dozens and dozens of agencies. Never once have we found out that there's someone at an agency or institution that cares about this issue of fossil fuels has found out that they're alone. Everyone has a connection with someone else who's aligned with them on a value, values level. And I think that hopefully can be a source of comfort and encouragement to kind of just get started. I have the word begin tattooed on my arm. Um, so that's, that's really how we think about this process is like someone has to raise their voice, you find the second person who finds the third person who finds the fourth person and um, it's sort of cliche, but it really works. Yeah, I've really noted that over the years, the community building that's taken place with yes. Clean Creators and Purpose Disruptors, you can see the momentum building. So I think that's a, a wonderful um, point to make and hence why you're all invited here. So to keep that movement going. Um, tell us about the recent, you've had an update to the F list, yes. you? Go on, <laughs> go on, tell us about so, that. <laughs> one of the solutions that we try to practice is transparency. Um, and if you are a company or an individual who cares about climate change and you're working with or at an agency that has fossil fuel clients, that's a conflict of interest. Um, fossil fuel companies are responsible for three quarters of global emissions. They're the biggest polluters, the biggest greenwashers, the biggest obstructors of climate change. And we think that it's important that companies who hire those agencies understand where, where their agencies stand. Um, and that's not information that's readily available, so we make it readily available. Um, and so this morning, um, not but an hour and a half ago, um, we released the F-List 2024, um, which was a product of seven months of research of us trolling dozens of different sources of information, ad databases, government disclosures, portfolio sites, on and on. Uh, and what we found is that there are 590 ad or PR agencies around the world that are engaged with 100 or 1,010 different contracts with fossil fuel companies, which sounds like a lot. Um, but you know, earlier this month, um, Campaign Magazine did a survey of you know, 100 top agencies in the UK, and what they found is that 75% of them uh, don't work with fossil fuel clients, another 15% are trying to reduce the amount that they work with fossil fuel clients, and only 10% are still doing it. Um, and we called our report today the Mad Men Fueling the Madness because that was a line that the UN Secretary General used when he called on the advertising industry to drop fossil fuel clients this year, um, but also really summarizes where we're at. You know, 
A lot of things have changed in the ad industry. You can't smoke inside anymore. There's no more three martini lunches. But <laughs> when it comes to sustainability, when it comes to climate change, it might as well be 1970. Yeah. Um, and these agencies are so far behind reality. Um, renewable investment in renewable energy is double that of fossil fuels this year. Um, and if you're stuck with these fossil fuel clients, you are not engaging with that transition honestly or as effectively as you can. So we think this kind of transparency is valuable to clients, it's valuable to employees, and it's also valuable to agencies. They need to know that this is something they need to get out of. It's also um, very in line with wider moves on transparency. Yeah. So it's not the only industry that um, uh, has more disclosure requirements. You know, many of, of our corporate partners are dealing with CSRD and now coming CSDDD. So. You know, it's a, it's a, everyone's in on this. It's a rising tide of, of more and more transparency. So we'll come back to that, that transparency issue. But um, Lamia, um, I think, uh, or La La Lamia, sorry, um, I think you could give a really good um, uh, kind of story development on that and what it's like to be working in an agency. I know that you, at Lucky Generals, uh, you've signed the Clean Creative Pledge okay. and have taken that. Uh, that solutions approach forward into your work. Can you tell us a little bit about that in your work? Yeah, sure. So Lucky Generals um, is 11 years old. We're a creative company for people on a mission. We, like Purpose Disruptors, started in a pub. We're all good. <laughs> we're can start. And um, yeah, we believe that, you know, creativity, the biggest impact that we have is our creative output. And, you know, it's thinking about how we can harness that as a force for good. My title, Head of Social Impact, not, there's not a lot of titles out there in the advertising sector, but it's really challenging our clients and thinking about where do we move the conversation from purpose and intent to actual tangible, sticky, real, measurable outcomes. That's kind of what my, my remit is within Lucky's. And you may have seen, you might not be familiar with, um, we, we created a monster, Oblivia Coal Mine, with Make My Money Matter. So nothing helps in kind of getting a conversation started, which was um, quite a quite a tedious conversation, you know, kind of greening your pensions is quite a difficult subject matter, but um, it works when you get um, uh, an Oscar winning darling in latex and channeling the powers of a fossil fuel exec to get cut through and, and change that conversation in culture. And we saw an uplift where, you know, after that campaign went live, 50% more people were thinking about how they wanted to change their pension provider. And that made us think and reflect, well, if we're doing this in the outside world, how can we think about how we do this internally within our business and our agency operations? And I think the first aha moment that we had was you know, joining Clean Creatives. And that didn't actually come from senior leadership or from myself. It came from a general, um, Omid. He was a, an account director. He said, have you, have you heard about these guys? Um, we looked at, we looked you guys up. We're like, this sounds like a no-brainer. And then we, we signed up to the pledge, but we wanted to do something more than just sign up to pledge, because there's pledges everywhere. So we kind of just <laughs> chatted to you earlier this year, and we said, you know, is there anything that we can do within Luckies in, in supporting the movement? And, you know, luckily we hosted the London event back in March, and through that conversation, we got exposed to this brilliant, amazing community. And, you know, it's been an amazing journey in the last year, because when you're in an agency, you don't necessarily have all the insight and expertise in-house, but there's so much good out there. So whether it is learning how to build that business case internally to kind of, you know, not work with a fossil fuel polluter, or, you know, we've done some brilliant work with Creators for Climate and, and joining the Ethical Agency Alliance. So really interesting conversations with agency leaders discussing what does it mean to be an ethical agency? You know, how can we share best practice? You know, having that forum and being collaborative and, and you know, when we're not pitching against each other, actually trying to think about solutions and how we can figure it out together. There's a lot of camaraderie in the space, which has been, yeah, for us within, within Lucky's, uh, a great experience for us, but we're definitely on that learning journey, like, like other agencies. Um, and sorry, I should have introduced you properly. It's Lamia Chowdhury, Head of Social Impact um, and Client Partner at uh, Lucky Generals. I love that point there about some of the unexpected benefits from this. That actually, because again, if you know, it's kind of quite standard if you work in 
general advertising, if you like, oh, the fun's gone. It's not like it was in the old days. <laughs> but actually, to think that this can give a renewed sense of camaraderie, purpose, excitement, joy, I think is a, an, an under-recognized benefit of working in this area. Yeah, and I think it's, like, it's almost like a virtuous circle, right? Because, you know, we were kind of doing good work out there. We work with Make My Money Matter pro bono. We believe in their mission. Um, and, you know, we're working in that kind of consumer space and getting the message out there. But actually, how do you galvanize and apply that within your agency operations and within the agency four walls? You know, and I think that's what's been really galvanizing. And, you know, one of the great things is, you know, there's a lot of education out there as well. So, like, just learning from Rob about, I'm a massive geek, you know, social impact. It's all about measurables and, you know, metrics. And the fact that there's amazing frameworks um, to actually measure the impact holistically, because I think that's been a big challenge for us. There's lots of different, there's a lot of patchy data out there. So actually finding frameworks that support us on that aspect. And then also working with Creators for Climate as well. They have an amazing anti-greenwashing course, which I just should recommend everyone to do because it's taught us a lot about how we, can A, understand and navigate the conversation because there's a lot of terminology, it's quite complicated to digest, especially, you know, with different parts of the business, you know, trying to explain it to creatives or strats, it's a different conversation. But one of the things that we're really passionate about is disseminating that within the agency, but also taking it to our clients and challenging them to kind of, you know, be braver and to think about, you know, that shift from intent to impact. So it's kind of, all working together in a kind of circle. Right. Um, and at this moment, I would love to do a call out as well, because a lot of that movement building and community building has been funded by the KR Foundation, who's also funded um, a lot of the work on advertiser missions and where we're going next, uh, uh, client disclosure reports. So that, uh, I think, is really important, something I would encourage other funders to look at as well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, um, uh, Alice, I'm going to turn to you now. Uh, Alice Rochnold is um, a strategy director at Futera, and she was also working with Futera Solutions Union uh, to update the methodology of our, our transparency tool, which is called the Client Disclosure Report. Um, now, uh, Futera created the first Client Disclosure Report. It's, it's a report by which agencies and now wider consultants, wider professional services, can disclose who pays their bills. Um, so it, 2015, um, we did the first one. 2019, we updated it and actually made it um, freely available for other agencies to come on board as well and to do. Again, recognizing that piece that the material impact is the work that we do as an agency, not our operational footprint. Um, lots of agencies came on board, pledged to um, uh, create a report, uh, many did so, but what we realized in the kind of the following years is it's quite difficult <laughs> to do a client disclosure report, and particularly if you work at a smaller agency, um, if you're looking at how you're setting up your operational frameworks, etc. So again, with the help of KR, Futera Solutions Union has updated that methodology, um, and it's live today, actually it was live on Monday, but it's launching today. Um, and Alice, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about um, kind of, you know, the underpinning of the methodology um, why it's been updated, you know, what the kind of the, the methodology is built on, that type of thing. Thank you, Lucy. Um, and so in terms of the client disclosure reporting initiative, what it was really lacking was a standardized methodology and, and more importantly, an easy to adopt methodology. And this is why Futura Solutions Union, with the help of KR Foundation, has decided to revise and refine our methodology to make sure that it is uh, widely adoptable. And so we've created a step-by-step -step process um, to help uh, um, any professional service providers uh, implement uh, client uh, disclosure reporting within their operations. And we're really lucky at Futura Solutions Union because we have our own um, professional service providers, Futura, <laughs> and so we were able to actually 
test our methodology using our own operations as well to ensure that it is, again, very easy to adopt, especially for SMEs, because we know that the reporting burden is real. Um, so the idea here was really to um, simplify and streamline the process as much as possible so that we can really make sure uh, that there is widespread adoption of that tool. Um, and obviously, we would not have been able to do that in our own little eco chamber. Uh, we've worked with many partners. Uh, most of them are actually on stage uh, today. And we were also able to kind of tap into their brain to kind of understand which gap um, the client disclosure reporting could fill within the industry uh, as well. So in terms of the updated methodology, I would love to highlight kind of the four key principles that are really at the heart of that revised methodology. And the first one is universality. So Lucy mentioned CDR um, has been initiated in uh, 2015, and the focus of CDR back then was really on the advertising industries. But as we know, professional service providers, they have a wide influence lawyers, consultants. So we have decided to make sure that this methodology is actually applicable um, to all professional services providers, regardless of your size, your location, your industry. Then the second uh, core principle is obviously comparability, right? We were trying to create a level playing field where stakeholders, be it investors, customers, could easily compare practices across the board as well. And that will require um, consistent format, <laughs> frankly, and standardized uh, metrics above all. Then our third principle, that I'd love to highlight today is accountability. And obviously the aim of client disclosure reporting is to really help stakeholders um, hold professional service providers accountable for their action and practices and really ensure that their portfolio is aligned with um, their values and the broader sustainability movement uh, as well. And last but not least, objectivity. So we obviously wanted um, factual data that can be presented in a neutral and unbiased manner. So to uphold all of these principles in um, the revised methodology, we've made a specific call. So the methodology is really focusing on the client industry and sector and the economic value associated with that, but we're not factoring in the specifics um, nature of the project that the service provider is actually providing to the client. And I know that this is super important context to actually properly gauge um, the role of a service providers in uh, helping their client move the needle and lessen the impact of their uh, operations as well. Um, so let's take fashion, for example. Some service providers uh, might actually enable um, fashion clients to continue with uh, overconsumption and, and, and push growth, whereas other service providers might actually help them get away of that take, wake, uh, take, take make, and waste model. Um, and so we've made that call because basically weighing in the specific nature of the project description as well as the client motivation will go against um, objectivity, comparability, and accountability just because of the sheer subjectivity that goes with that. And so we recognize um, that the client disclosure reporting is very much a first step in the disclosure journey before um, agency kind of almost graduate to uh, other initiative and continue disclosing in other ways, um, using, for example, the Exponential Roadmap Initiative professional um, service matrix that was launched yesterday, look it up, or um, service mission from Purpose Disruptors uh, as well. So looking at it very much as a first step to really foster uh, and strengthen transparency within, within the industry. And we've had the updated principles from UN Climate as well. As um, well, yes. From Oxford Net Zero. So yeah, it nests within a really nice range of tools now, doesn't it? Yeah. So Ali, show us how it works. Uh, how, if you are 
you know, an SME and you need some support in doing it, or if you're a, a bigger consultancy and you want to make sure that you're following good transparency guidelines, but what do you do? Perfect. So I will walk you through the new methodology and hopefully you'll leave this room feeling very empowered and excited <laughs> about how simple it is actually to implement it um, in, in your own agency. And, and spoiler alert, there is an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, which I'm even more excited about. So all right, here is a revised methodology. I'll just uh, leave it up for a second if you want to scan that QR code to access uh, the website and the new report. Great. Perfect. I love seeing so many smartphones up. <laughs> Amazing. Great. And you'll see there are a lot of other resources on the website as well and we'll continue um, developing resources as well uh, to really help um, you as an agency implementing uh, client disclosure reporting. So let's go in to the different step. Step one, list all clients. That should be fairly easy. Mm -hmm. uh, you probably, most of you have even a CRM to help you doing that step. So list your client, compile them um, in a spreadsheet or database. Then the idea here is to log revenue share. So look at the financial year and look at the total revenue generated for each of the clients that you've listed. So far, so good. We then will go into categorizing clients per their organization type. Obviously, we're not asking you to disclose your client names. So we are uh, going to anonymize client information through this step. So we'll ask you, is it a for-profit organization, a non-profit, or a governmental organization? And when it comes to for-profit organization, is it publicly traded or privately owned? And this is specifically important for that next step, classifying your clients according to their operation. And so we've decided to rely on the uh, Global Industry Classification Standards, JICS, uh, which is widely adopted um, and is international. And so they have different industry code where you can choose and match your client with that industry code. So for publicly traded company, what you can do is actually look at the main source of revenue of that publicly traded company because as we know now, some clients have widely different um, operations as well, so sometimes it's hard to classify. And if um, they're actually privately owned, rely on your own knowledge of the company, of the brand that you're working with to classify them um, and making sure that you log in the decision that you take and the assumption you took. For nonprofit organization, we're relying on the international classification on nonprofit organization from the UN. So incredibly similar to JIX, you have a drop-down list and you can choose um, which which um, organization uh, match which code. And then for governmental organization, you just need to say you're working with government. Um, so that's that's all. Super simple. Then the hardest part is done. And then <laughs> you, what we'll, you'll do is obviously then have a revenue matching those industry group because you've list your clients, you have your revenue share, you classified the clients, so now you have a nicely uh, Excel table with revenue per industry group, which is exactly the type of information that we want to disclose um, and visualize. So you then are free to choose any data visualization that you prefer to showcase uh, all of uh, your industry group and the revenue associated for that year and publish it into a client um, disclosure reporting reports. <laughs> uh, and the idea here is obviously to disclose that graph and, and visualization, but it's also an amazing opportunity for you as an agency to communicate on uh, your governance or any of the internal processes that you have in place to select clients and give a little bit of color also to, to that data and, and just um, shine light on uh, the work that you do uh, as well internally. Um, but again, as Lucy mentioned, I'm even more excited about this Excel spreadsheet, which is basically the tool we've created to make it as easy as possible for all of you to um, develop 
uh, client disclosure uh, reporting and report in no time. So I am now going to go into Excel. If we if we just flash this up super quick, and Alice wanted well, we wanted to show you this. So in terms of doing those steps, you can actually just go in when you go to that QR code, access this, and it essentially does it for you. Exactly. So you would go in and look at for-profit organization and you would be able to choose the organization type and then the uh, industry uh, description. And at the end of this uh, spreadsheet, you'll have a whole description and definition of all the industry sectors as well, so that you can understand a little bit of a nuance if you uh, have some doubts on which uh, category they would fall under. And then you would do the same thing for for-profit organization, non-profit organization, same for governmental organization as well. And then that would get you to yeah, so non-governmental -gov organization, we would do the same thing. Right. If we were go to the next tab. Thank you so much. Great. And then you would go to tabs. It will give you an aut like automatically generated summary of all of the industry group and the revenue, so you don't even have to do any calculation yourself. And then if we go to the graph, it would also automatically generate a great graph for you uh, per industry group, highlighting uh, which uh, biggest share of re revenue is coming from which industry as well. So again, extremely committed to improving this, improving the methodology, and so uh, hopefully uh, we'll get feedback from adopters as well, and we'll continue uh, developing the tool going forward. Thank you, Ali. So that's great to see. <laughs> really great to see. So as an individual within your agency, you can ask to create, create a client disclosure report, you can do one yourself, and if you are a client or a partner, you can ask your consultants to do one. All right, so thank you for that. Um, we're now going to take some questions. So we've got a roving mic around, and we've got a couple of questions already. We'll spend about 10 minutes or so on this, and if you've got any questions online, send them in. So two questions here to start with. Hello, uh, I love what you're doing, it's fantastic uh, on the fossil fuels. I have two questions, two quick questions. First of all, what about sectors beyond the fossil fuels, for example, the fast fashion sector? The other, the other question that I have is you are doing wonderful work at the agency level. What about at the industry level? Because for, in my mind, for every agency that is working in this way, it does create space for non-scrupulous other agencies to take your place or for fossil fuel companies or other destructive yep. companies to do it in-house. Great, lovely. Well, uh, was there a second round of questions? And uh, Robin, Lamy, and perhaps if you can take the first and Duncan the second, yeah. And then, but let's take, was there a second? Yeah, this gentleman here, we'll just take a few and then we'll answer them all. Thank you all. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, um, I had a question for Duncan. Uh, first off, congratulations on publication, uh, the publication of the list. It looks awesome. A lot of familiar names, <laughs> like last year. <laughs> so, um, um, uh, my, my question would be, so um, I've been in agencies for a little over two decades. Um, I got out. I, just, I escaped. <laughs> um, but um, in my network, in, if, if I look around me in the conversations that I'm having a lot of times, like the number one argument of uh, agencies and people within agencies against like cutting ties with fossil um, uh, brands specifically but also other brands like you're mentioning would be um, if you cut the ties, it also that means you give up the opportunity to change the company or the brand from within. Yeah. Um, so what would your response be to that, besides you're totally naive of being able to do that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to see if I can grab that one, but also pass around. So thank you. Uh, awesome questions. Get a few more ready. And Rob, do you want to start us off with um, f uh, industries other than fossil fuel? Yeah, really good question. Uh, and that's something that we, we certainly look like when we're working uh, with agencies as part of our Change Brief Alliance program, which is all around how do you give people the skills and an understanding of what are the behaviours and culture change you need to influence in the work. And part of that is actually working with experts across different categories, such as fashion, understanding that 
All of those categories need to transition if they are to be future fit, right? The business models have been developed, and back to, back to the central idea here, right? The solutions already exist out there. So the idea of what we need to understand and working with, um, with the ad industry is understanding, like, connecting the expertise and the knowledge and the transition models with the people who can communicate those effectively, with the people who can engage and influence um, clients, audiences in a way that helps them in that transition. So for us, it's, and it's part of the advertised emissions concept, it's not purely just around um, fossil fuels, but other high carbon mm. emitting industries, um, long haul travel, say, mm. fashion. It's being able to understand what, understanding a map of where we are now and how do we need to transition and how do we either make sure we don't end up with stranded business models, uh, or stranded business clients, who, um, and also help if we can, in that transition, where it is possible uh, to transition some of those categories. Great. Uh, and uh, um, I wonder if you might take question one and three a little bit. So uh, do you, uh, within Lucky Generals, do you look at um, exclusion of clients other than fossil fuel? And um, where are you on that? Do you have those conversations internally about can we move them along a journey for impact? Yeah, 100%. It's about entering to dialogue. So even before we you know, we pitch for business, we do a due diligence, we think about, and we have, you know, the chemistry sessions, you know, really important because you you help understand what the motivations for a client, because, you know, as we all know, there are different parts of their social impact journey. So I think it's about whether we think that we can, you know, drive them towards a more equitable and inclusive world, and how can we support them in doing that? And can they do that transparently? Because we don't want to be part of kind of not, you know, not doing it in an authentic way. So can you measure it? Can you prove it? Do you have your receipts? You know, that's kind of, I, that's, a, that's always my phrase. I'm like, do you have your fucking receipts? You know, do you have your shopping <laughs> order? You might not have everything in place right now, but what are you doing and how can we support you on that journey? But I think that's, you know, you need to have that open dialogue. But um, I do think, you know, there, there's, you know, there are kind of, there's definitely checklists out there that I've seen from the community about how you can do a due diligence process. But I think a lot of it is having that conversation with the client before you have them on board and seeing where you think you can make that impact yeah. and right. how you can take it. And Duncan, do you want to pick up on that and also work at industry level? Because I know you spend yeah. quite a bit of your time on that. So in terms of the work on the industry level, um, you know, there's always someone who's going to take the money. That's the reality, right? Um, but every agency has a unique value proposition. Um, Everybody is coming to work today. I'm the best at what I do here. And I think the more that we take that, those unique value propositions away from the fossil fuel industry, the less power they have. Um, another way to put this is um, a lot of bad agencies are bad at what they do. And bad work is bad. And <laughs> I, I would much rather have a less talented, less capable, less connected agency do work for fossil fuel companies because it means they'll be less effective at lying at what, about what they do. And that's the truth. And like, honestly, this is already happening. You know, the, there is not a single, there was not a single fossil fuel industry campaign even submitted for awards at Cannes, DNAD, The One Show. Um, the agencies that win those awards tend not to be on the F list. This sorting is already happening and it's gonna accelerate. Um, the other thing I just want to point out just on this level is that um, it's true that a lot of the very, very big contracts in the fossil fuel industry go to holding company agencies, but for the F-list report, about 70% of the agencies on the list are independent. And independent agencies have an extraordinarily important role to play both in the problem and in the solution. Um, and when it comes to sort of the, the leverage question, like can we push these companies from the inside, I, I think there's two answers to that. One is sort of the the true answer and one is the polite answer. Go on, give us both. <laughs> um, the true answer is where's the beef? Like where's, where's the proof that any of this has ever worked, period? I mean, BP was advertising they were going beyond petroleum in 2006. This summer, they cut all of their wind, their wind energy explorations and they sent them all to look for oil. It's just there's no proof that this has ever, ever worked. And I just think you have to have that realistic starting point that like, no proof. And I think the point at which you are being paid by a fossil fuel company, you don't have leverage over them. They have leverage over you. You're backwards. The way that you influence these companies is you say, I'm not going to work with you until. 
that is the point in which you have the most leverage and the most influence. And you know, there's a lot of people in the creative industry who want to do good because being an effective communicator means having empathy. And I think we want to put people in the driver's seat and say that this is the way that you are standing in your power at the greatest point of leverage, and you should use it by being principled about who we work with. And there's huge opportunity there, as we've touched upon. So looking at advertising, but also wider professional services. Um, and Elise mentioned the uh, work that's been launched um, or being developed and updated by um, Exponential Roadmap on a climate solutions framework. This is the paradigm shift that we're going through. So for advertising, but also more widely for consultants, finding and supporting the climate solutions is the longer term or even mid or now business mm. plan. Um, all right, any more questions? Uh, yeah, uh, we've got uh, two here. Thank you. And actually, we'll take those, we'll quickly answer those, and we'll give a final closing piece of advice from everyone. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, Susan Joy. Hi. Um, with uh, fossil fuel companies you know, actually talking about moving into plastics um, as, you know, that's where the opportunity lies in the future as we move away from fossil fuels directly, it's into petroleum products. Um, you know, how do you, how do you take a stand there? Because plastics are, are rampant, you know, it's, it's literally in everything. And um, whilst we're, there's starting to be movements away from it, it's everywhere. Yeah. So in fashion and every product that we make, there's yeah. plastics. Okay, great. So what do we do about plastics? And there was another question. If it, yes, sorry, the uh, lady here, um, and if you could, uh, uh, ask your question, we'll quickly answer, and then we'll do that. Uh, I'm going to build on actually what was just said. I'm uh, in Brussels, so I'm coming from a public affairs space. Um, I've worked on issues like biologicals versus pesticides, or plant-based materials versus petrochemical plastics um, for years to change the laws on those. And in Brussels, you have every agency, pretty much 90%, who are employed by those sectors. Mm either directly or by NGO, uh, they call them NGOs, but they're kind of associations. So um, I'm wondering also about like um, the other climate impacts like meat and dairy, mm -hmm. those areas which are now much more clear in terms of their climate methane impact. Um, how do you... How do you integrate that kind of in this uh, world beyond uh, yeah. climate emissions, fossil fuel emissions? Because we know now that many other sectors have really a massive impact too. Yeah. I'll take a quick answer on that and then pass along, which is, um, so uh, not as Futera Solutions Union, but as Futera, um, we have a process by which we, um, so if it's something is, uh, if a, if a brief is around um, getting us to a 1.5 degree aligned world, then that's great. We take it. We will communicate that, uh, you know, uh, high and wide. If it's not, then we have a commitment to work with that client in order to get them to basically be kind of ready for race to zero. And that's part of the work we do as a climate solutions provider. Um, it's not always easy to do, but that's the commitment that we've made. So if it's a climate solution, um, it can be communicated, but if it's not, and we do comms and strategy, then we work on the strategy to get that client to be ready there. If that sounds really easy, it is not. <laughs> but that's the kind of the governance and the decision making thing we do. Does anyone else want to pick up on that in terms of um, plastics and industries quite briefly? Super briefly. I think it's just elevating to the bigger question of what are the values and what are the consumption, um, yeah, consumption levels and lifestyles that you can influence in the work to put out and starting with that kind of yeah. point. Right. Yeah. All right. Now, yeah, do, do you want to pick up plastics? Yeah. We did, I mean, we did a campaign with co-ops, so their supermarket in the UK, about how you could, about the circular economy, and about how you can actually recycle your plastic. So there was, that was an actionable campaign. It wasn't part of the client brief. It was just something that we brought to them. So there are ways that you can navigate that. But I think it's really tricky. It's tricky to try and, from a due diligence perspective, just how far down the supply chain that you go. I think part of it is kind of, from a creative agency perspective, just where is that willingness? to, yeah, 
to, to measure their impact. And one of the things that I've been developing within Lucky Generals <clears throat> The social impact framework, another framework, sorry guys, <laughs> but actually supporting our clients to be transparent about what if you do want to be making a difference in these spaces, you know, beyond awareness, what else are you doing there to actually measure this and are you doing it long term? Yeah. Because then it's kind of a flash in the pan, isn't it? So that's the conversations that we're having and trying to direct our clients on. Right. Can I just say can yes, one yes. briefly? Yeah. Um, you know, I haven't eaten meat or animal products for 20 years, like I really believe in that. Uh, but energy is the biggest part of the climate problem. I mean, I, I think there's lots of ways to, there are lots of things we do that contribute to climate change. The number one cause of climate change is energy, transportation, and those come from fossil fuels. And if we're going to solve this problem, we have to solve the biggest part first. And it's also fortunately the ones where we have the most solutions. Um, you know, it's very easy to, I mean, I'm going to say this from the stage. Oh, very easy. You just swap out the solar panels. But you know, energy is, is a problem we can solve. Transportation is a problem. They have known solutions. The technology is ripe. It's ready. Yeah. And like, we just have to start there. And we have to go as fast as we can in the sectors where we know we can solve the problem. Great. Right. I'm pleased you made that point. That's a good point to almost end on. Perhaps we could do, oh, we're running out of time. But let's do 30 seconds on final piece of advice. Alice, can I start with you? Yes. As an insider. What can you do? <laughs> of course. So professional service providers can no longer be neutral in choosing their clients. And so we really hope that the client disclosure reporting initiative is going to help further transparency requirements in the industry. So go to the website and launch your own <laughs> report <laughs> would be my piece of advice. Fabulous. I was just going to say, you know, if you're in an agency or in the creative sector, seek out friends that have the knowledge and expertise. Just go out and make friends and bring that knowledge into your agency operations and figure out how you can take that to the clients as well. And just to say, pubs are great <laughs> places to have this conversation because after the Clean Creators event that we hosted back in March, we basically created a Genesis post project called the Lucky Green Book, which is we need in the industry a, a, you know, a directory of sustainable suppliers to help us with that production process. And we kind of came up with that conversation, I think about one o'clock in the morning in the pub after the Ingrid's <laughs> event, but we're actually making it happen. So if you guys have any contacts or want to be a part of it, just reach out. But that's just something that we've, um, yeah, that, uh, that, that's been very productive and impactful from a, from a pub conversation. That's awesome. Um, Duncan, final bit of advice. Is it go to the pub? Uh, <laughs> yes, we're having a happy hour tonight at 6 p.m. <laughs> Co-sponsored by Shimek Strategic. It's near Union Square. Um, please uh, find us on Instagram. It'll be fun. Uh, second is just get started. You know, it, it's always so much harder to think about this when you are just churning on it, waiting to begin. And as soon as you take that first step, it really falls into place much faster than you can ever imagine. So just right. get going. Okay. Rob? Definitely. Pubs are the solution because <laughs> I'm just thinking of advertised emissions. It took, at Oliver and Emerson Statue, it took two dedicated, committed individuals to push, yep. to push that concept. And it needed, it, for them, it needed them to be able to know there are others who are also asking these questions. And it's that support network, it's that community. So if you're working across other, other professional service industries, start a community across. Yeah, beyond what your organization to transcend competition, because that's the experience that's helped drive the change that I've seen in the last four years of Purpose Disruptors, yeah. building community. Fab, I will close with um, make it fun if you want it done. So bring a little bit of light and humor to it, and also be kind to yourself, because it is, it's exciting, but it's hard work as well. All right, uh, I want to thank you, the panel. It's been absolutely wonderful to have you. Thank you so much.